I want us to get straight into the word this morning. And so if you could open your Bibles to John chapter 16 and verse 33. Uh, I'm going to start us out with a scripture that is sure to not bring joy to your heart. Um, and it's not going to encourage you. But that's why I'm here, is to not encourage you and to not bring joy to your heart. So in John chapter 16 and verse 33, we see the voice of Jesus being heard. Uh, this is red letter. So get mad at him, not me, when we read this. Uh, but Jesus is giving a prophecy. You could even call it a promise in John chapter 16 and verse 33. And he tells us, in this world, in this world, you, say that's me, that's me. will have trouble. trouble. You're welcome. Uh, you will have trouble. Another word for trouble is difficulties, trials, tribulation, distress, and suffering. And honestly, when was the last time that you saw that scripture verse? In this world, you will have trouble printed on a coffee cup for you to enjoy every morning as you sip your cup of coffee, watch the sunrise, and you go, ah, oh, this is the day the Lord has made. In this world, I will have trouble. It's not a scripture that we typically run to for encouragement, but it is a scripture that we can run to in those moments in our life where we wonder, why is there trouble? Right here in River City, that rhymes with P and that stands for pool. And so why do we have trouble in life? And uh, so Jesus here, he, he's giving us the answer to it. He's saying, in this world, you will have trouble. He gives us a warning of that. In this world, there are going to be trials, difficulties, things that happen that we don't like or we don't understand, circumstances that we could definitely live without. Have any of you ever experienced any of this in life? You're like, you know, I could live without this. This is a little bit too much refining fire. It's a little too much pressure. Enough oil has been produced. Let's move on from this, please. Um, but the reason why this happens is because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. We read this in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. You don't have to turn there. Just jot it down if you're taking notes. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. It says the whole world, the whole world, that includes the believer and the non-believer, the whole world lies under the wicked one. So we are under a fallen system. That's why sometimes you might get a cavity in your mouth, right? We live in a fallen system, in a fallen world. I said this last week, and I'll say it again. It's been hitting my heart so hard every time that I say it or I hear it. The closest thing, uh, this life, the earth that we're experiencing right? The, the world that we see, this life, it is the closest thing that a believer will experience to hell, this life. And this life is also the closest thing that a non-believer will experience to heaven. And when you hear that, the first time I heard it, it, it shook me to my core because I realized, wait a second, it does get better, but at the same time, wait a second, I need to be a little bit more diligent and I need to be more consumed with the heart of God, which is souls. Because if this is heaven, ugh, right? No, thank you. And, and so we, we, we have to have that statement jar our spirit to know that heaven is real and the reality of hell is real too, right? So it's something that we, that we need to be awakened to. So today I want us to look at what to do when life wounds us. What to do when circumstances try to cripple us. When pain paralyzes us. How many of you have ever been there before? You're like, I just, I can't move forward. I can't move back. I'm just totally frozen. And when tribulation comes and it knocks at our door. And, and this is not a typical sermon uh, that is a Michelle message. Uh, but how many of you know that the Lord can speak in prophetic pictures? Uh, sometimes he'll, he'll speak audibly, like you'll hear his voice. Sometimes there'll be an impression in your heart. Uh, sometimes you'll see something and the Lord will speak through that. Sometimes like with Jesse, you're praying and you say something and you're like, whoa, wait a second, that was not me, that was totally God. There are a million and one ways that the Lord can speak to us. And just when we think we have it all figured out how he can speak to us, he throws in a million more ways. 
Uh, and so sometimes the Lord for myself, he'll speak through a, a picture. It's like, I'll, I'll just see something or I'll think about something and, and he starts talking to my heart. And on June 11th, that was the last time that I shared, um, that was a Sunday, I shared with you guys the message. Two days later, on June 13th, I was just praying with, it, with my time with the Lord. It wasn't anything special. I wasn't doing anything, you know, super deep. I was just sitting in my room and praying. And I saw this picture, it was like a flash, of a person holding in their right hand a propane tank, like what you use to grill uh, barbecue, right? Hot dogs, hamburgers, like, like we're going to have in just a couple minutes. And um, I saw this, this flash, this picture of this person holding the propane tank. And my spirit knew what the Lord was saying, but I needed my head and my flesh to catch up. And it's always smart, even when you think you know what God is saying, just to say, God, can you please describe to me exactly what you're trying to say? And uh, my, my heart knew that it was play on words. And I heard God say, my children right now are holding on to propane, professional level pain. It's a deep pain. This is not amateur. This is not like, oh, someone took my parking spot. Someone took my, my seat at church and it hurt my heart. This is deep level pain. This is a pain that you've been walking with. Maybe it recently has hit. Maybe it's been going on for a couple years. Maybe this has been even a generational pain. But you find yourself holding on to the pro pain, the professional level pain in your life. And, and you just can't seem to let it go. There's not a freedom that's coming from it. And so when I saw that, the next thing I saw was the propane tank that's actually here on the church property. There's, there's one that's, I guess it's more out this back wall. And uh, recently we had the propane tank just managed, just a maintenance, just to check valves and levels. And we had it um, just prettied with some paint and we had the company come out and do all that. And in that process of checking on the propane tank, the, the quality of it, um, I found out something that I was not aware of. Propane never expires. Did you know that? Okay, how many of you knew that propane never expires? Okay, the smart ones in here. Good job. Um, I didn't know that. Propane never expires. And so when I saw the, the flash of that propane tank, I felt in my heart like the Lord was saying, oftentimes what happens, and we don't, no one wants to do this, right? No one wants to walk around with pain in their heart. No one wants to walk around holding the weight of, of circumstances. But what happens is situations build in our life, and we store it up, and all of a sudden we're no longer able to just carry around the propane. Now we're chained to a professional level propane tank, and we become immobilized. There's, there's no way we can tote that thing around. We are chained. And I literally saw with this propane tank, someone chained at their, weight, at their waist to that propane tank. And I was reminded, propane never expires. And I heard the Lord so clearly, Michelle, the world's cliche is, the world's cliche is time heals all wounds. How many of you have heard that? Time heals all wounds. And I've even said it before. I've said it multiple times. I've said it to myself. I've said it to others, especially those who, who are dealing with something. Time, time, time will heal it. Just give it some time. Just give it some time. And I heard the Lord say, the world's cliche, Michelle, is time heals all wounds. But that's not true. Only I can heal all wounds. He is the only one who can cut that professional chain of propane in our life. He is the only one. He is the only one who can heal those things that are so deep. And, and what I'm talking about, like I said, it's not like, oh, someone, you know, cut in front of me at the grocery store and, you know, it, it, it hurt me. This is deep stuff. It could be the loss of a loved one and it could be the loss that happened recently or it could be a loss that happened. The number that kept came, coming to my heart this past week was, was three years. And I don't, it can be more than that, like. God knows, but I kept hearing three years, three years ago, three years ago. It could be three years ago. It could be three months ago. It could be 30 years ago. And, and you'll see something or you'll, you'll remember something or you'll hear something. And it's as if it happened yesterday. 
the loss of a loved one. It could be a divorce. You know, I've, I've actually heard it said that divorce is likened unto death because it's a splitting, because the two have become one flesh, and so there's a breaking apart of the two. Uh, it could be a, a relationship. You know, I kept feeling in my heart this past week, siblings. <laughs> Gotta love siblings. Um, but a, a tearing of relationship between a sibling or a parent or, or a child or a loved one, whatever it might be, you know what, what has been carrying around in your heart, that deep level of pain, the Lord and only the Lord can heal it. He's the only one. He's the only one who, will, who you'll see freedom come when you allow him to cut that chain. So I want us to see Isaiah 53. I want you to turn there and I want you to see it with your eyes because I really feel in my heart and this is a bold statement, that someone is going to get completely set free. Hallelujah. Like total freedom. Total freedom. Isaiah 53 and verse 4. We don't have to carry, because we were not designed to carry, the weight of the, of the pain and the trial and the turmoil that this world throws at us. We were not designed to carry that. Isaiah 53 and verse 4. It says, Surely he took up our pain. This is speaking of Jesus. He took up our pain, our sorrows, our grief, our distress, and he carried our suffering. So there's this beautiful divine exchange that takes place. And, and Jesse touched on this. It's a divine exchange. The tree, which is the cross, handled it for us. Jesus paid it all. He's on the cross. And what does he say? He says, it is finished. It is finished. And because of this, we have the right and the ability to cast our cares, the things that we can't carry anymore. It's too heavy. It's too harsh. It's too much. God, I cast my cares to you. And he's saying, throw them to me because I am well able to carry it for you. He carried the cross the wooden beams, he had splinters being dug into his hands. He's able to carry the weight and the pain that this world has thrown at you. He can, he can handle it. So God, I cast my cares, my worry, my fear, my anxiety. I cast every single thing that has happened, that I'm going through, or I might face tomorrow. God, you are the one who holds my tomorrow. So I cast it all to you and I give it all to you. And then you cast it, and then you don't take it back. You say, Holy Spirit, I thank you that that chain is broken. Does that sound good? Yes. Hallelujah. So we know that we can trust him to be released from that propane in our life. And this, this applies to sorrow, to sickness, and to sin. And so today, I want us to let go of that professional level of pain. Because in this life, you will have trouble. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Who in here has never had any trouble? You've never had any sorrow. You've never gone through anything difficult. You've just had a, a wonderful, happy, uh, peachy keen. Nothing ever's happened. Glory to God. Okay, so this message applies to us all. But in one moment, listen to this, in one moment, only God, only God can supernaturally set you free. Oh, and in one moment, he is the only one who breaks those chains. And I believe that the anointing of God is here to see the yoke and the bondage and the chain of pain and disappointment and sorrow completely broken. And again, there's a divine exchange. You, you say, Holy Spirit, you come take all the sorrow, all the grief, all the disappointment. You come and you take it all. And in divine exchange, what do I take on? I take on his yoke. I take on his burden. It's light and it's easy. Glory to God. It's a beautiful divine exchange. So one way that we see this freedom is by getting into the word. Now there's a lot of ways that we see the chains of, of, of the Lord broken, uh, oh, excuse me, a pain broken. We can see it through um, prayer. We can see it through communion. We can see it through worship. We can see it through the word. There's a million and one ways, but I want us to focus in specifically on seeing the chains broken when we get into the Word. Because when we get into the Word, the Word of God gets into us. It, it feeds us. It fills us. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen before. 
But have you ever read your Bible before? And you're like, who's looking at who? Right? Am I reading my Bible or is my Bible reading me? Because this is hitting exactly with what I'm dealing with. And if you've ever had that moment happen before, uh, then you have experienced what God says when he says the word of God is living. It is active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It actually cuts apart spirit from flesh, bone from marrow. And what does it do? It cuts away the fat. It cuts away the things of this world that doesn't need to be there. He is the great physician. And the scripture tells us that when Jesus speaks, that out of his mouth comes a sharp, double-edged sword. And according to the book of John, Jesus is the word that became flesh. So when the word speaks, the word cuts into our heart and it starts dividing those things that just don't need to be there. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so exciting. So we love the word. Amen. Amen. We love the word. And so one way that we can see freedom is through the word. Uh, We can also see it, like I said, in many other different ways. Charles Spurgeon, uh, incredible man of God, someone asked him one time, what is more important, worship or the word? And he said, you tell me, what is more important, breathing in or breathing out? And I thought, what, what a God-given answer, right? There's not one that, that you're going to see a, a better chance of freedom or a better chance of joy or a better chance. Just get into the Lord, into his river, but it's good to just start. Amen? So we're going to start with the word. Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. Spirit and life. So when you get into the word, you see that spirit and that life come. In Exodus chapter 38 and verse 8, you can turn there if you want. You can also look at it later this afternoon, but all of us might be sleeping after all those hot dogs, so you're more than welcome to turn there. Exodus 38 and verse 8, it actually speaks of the laver or the washing basin being made of the mirrors of the maidens. The mirrors of the maidens. The laver is what the priest would wash in before going deeper into the tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies. So they had to wash there. And think about this for a second. If the laver is made out of the maiden's mirrors, then that means that where they are washing, they're also seeing themselves. And the scripture, according to the word, is like a mirror. And it's so incredible because we actually, when we begin to read the word, we begin to see the very dirt that's on our face. But God doesn't just show us the dirt and say, oh man, good luck with that. I hope you find something to clean that off because you've got dirt on your face. No, he doesn't just show us the dirt, but through his grace, he in the very same place that exposes that dirt on our face, he washes us clean. This is the water of the washing of the word. That's what this is. So when you get into the word, he not only shows you, but he also says, hey, let's clean you up from the inside out. Isn't that beautiful? He's so merciful. He's so kind. He doesn't just say, oh, well, tough luck. Hope you find a bar of soap. Instead, he says, let me, let me be the one who washes your face. Let me be the one who renews you in my mercy. So let's get deep into the word. Psalm 147. We're going to turn here and we're going to stay here for a good amount of time. Psalm 147 and verse 3. We're going to break down the scripture so that we don't just know it, because this is one that we are more familiar with, that we don't just know it, but that we actually see it as nourishment for our soul. Right? It's, it's, this is a horrible description. It was described to me one time, but I never forgot it, and you won't either. Meditating on the word is like a cow chewing its cud. That's a horrible description. Um, but it's true. You take a scripture like Psalm 147 and verse 3. It's very small, very simple. And you digest it into your spirit, and then a couple minutes later, you think about it a little bit more. And then you think about it a little bit more. And then later on in the day, it's like a a cow chewing its cud. You think about it one more time. And and you just keep digesting it. And and each time you digest it, it's just better 
and it's yummier and it's more nourishment to your soul. Horrible description, not very pretty to think about, but that's honestly what meditating on the word is. It's just chewing on it. It's letting it become nourishment, not a head knowledge, but a habitation of the heart. That's what true meditation of the word is. So Psalm 147 and verse 3, it says, He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up all of their wounds. Okay, so we're going to break this down. The first word is he. You're like, wow, are we really breaking it down this much? Yeah, I got too much of my mama in me. He, he heals the brokenhearted. So the first thing to recognize is he is the one who does the healing. Think about this for a moment. This is God, the only one true living God. There is no other God. This is Jehovah. This is the one who uses earth as his footstool. This is the one who took the stars in his hand and he flung them into space and he knows each of them by name. This is Yahweh who with a blast of his nostrils, the Red Sea parted. And God Almighty, the one true living God, the one who formed you in your mother's womb, he knows your tomorrow and holds your future, and he goes, I want to be the one who heals their broken heart. Like, imagine that. He could send an angel, angel number 247. It's your job to go and heal their heart. No. No. In fact, he not only wants to be the one that heals your heart, but he so loved us that he gave his one and only son. So he adores being hands-on. He's like, there's a dirty job, and I want to do it. He, he's not afraid of the challenge. In fact, that's what the word compassion means. Throughout the New Testament, uh, specifically the four Gospels, you'll see this reoccurring phrase throughout the four Gospels. It says, Jesus was moved by compassion, and he healed them all. Every time you see that, just underline it. He, he, was, he was moved by compassion, and he healed them all. He was moved by compassion, and he healed them all. And that word compassion actually means that he is drawn to your weakness. He's drawn to it. So think about the weakest thing about you for a moment, the, the thing that just makes you cringe, the thing you've been working on for years, the thing that you're like, oh, Jesus, I beg you, please come and fix this. That's the very thing that draws him to you. That, that, that's incredible. You don't think it is? I think it's incredible. It's the very thing. It, it's the thing that everyone else runs from and he runs to. Wow. That, that's love. That's compassion. He is the one who does the healing. Let's keep going. He heals. He heals the brokenhearted. He heals the brokenhearted. Let's look at those three words. Heals the brokenhearted. That word brokenhearted is not a word uh, that, is, that is found in the Hebrew. It's, it's not a Hebrew word. So the actual word that would be used there is the word repair. So it would be he heals the heart that needs repairing. Okay, it's, it's, it's just a word game. It's not anything that dramatic. So don't, don't say, oh, my Bible is false. I'm going to throw it out. It's just, it's just a, a, a difference of words. He is the one who heals the heart that needs repair. So Jesus wants to repair your damaged heart. Why? Because he tells us this world will damage your heart. But he says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The scripture tells us that from the heart, that's where the issues of life flow. Jesus even tells us, uh, in the book of Matthew, he says it's from the heart that flows your thoughts, your emotions, your words, your actions. The heart is the center of who you are. And let me tell you a God's secret. This is why he wants your heart. This is it, right? Have, have you ever, when you got saved, someone said, do you want to give your heart to the Lord? He wants your heart. Why? Because he knows if he has your heart, he's got you. He has the core of who you are. And he recognizes that our heart in this life will face damage. And he doesn't say, oh, well, good luck with that. Instead, he is the one who repairs the damaged heart. Now, raise your hand in here if your job requires repairing. 
repairing or fixing things. Okay, we got some handy man, handy, handy people in here. Uh, please see us after service and let's see if we can use your abilities. Um, if your job consists of fixing things, then you are in the same field as God. Wow, don't let that go to your head. Um, but you have job security because there is a 100% chance that the thing that you specialize in fixing will break, right? A computer, it's gonna break sometime or another. A washer and dryer, it's gonna break. A toilet, it's gonna need a plumber. And so you find yourself in a place where you have a job, job security, because the thing that you fix will at one point or a time become broken. And God is the ultimate repairman. He knows that there will be a time, sometime in your life, might not be today, there will be a time where your heart needs repair. And he's so kind because he is the one who wants to fix your broken heart. You don't have to turn there because we literally just read this. John 16 and verse 33. Remember what it said, in this world you will have trouble. In this world you will have trouble. But I love this because he doesn't just say that and then say, oh, well, good luck. I'm out of here. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to sit down and I'm, I'm in retirement mode and I'll say a prayer for you. That's not the heart of Jesus. In fact, he, he actually continues that sentence. We're going to have a quick English class with a conjunction. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? That means keep reading. Keep reading. So he says, in this world you will have trouble, but, but, everyone say but. but. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. So he's saying, take heart. He's saying, and, and I think this is so true. Sometimes we just have to take our heart and go, I'm grabbing it. I'm taking heart. Why? Because he's overcome the world. And, and I, I'm grabbing my heart and I'm saying, peace be still. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. So even though this life can and will bring damage to our heart, we know that Jesus is the one who repairs the damaged heart. He himself wants to do this. He is the one who wants to do this. So let's look at Psalm 147 and verse 3, the last part of this. It says, he binds up their wounds. He binds up their wounds. This is so incredible because that word for bind is actually the word wrap. It's the word wrap. And when the word wrap is used, it's always connected to the subject that we're talking about. And the subject here is him. So he's saying, I am the Band-Aid. And I want to wrap you with myself, with my very presence. And think about this for a moment. If, if you have something that's broken or cut, typically, unless you're Grace and you're four years old, and you're addicted to putting a Band-Aid on and then ripping it off five minutes later to see if the boo-boo is healed, <laughs> typically what you do with, with a boo-boo is you wrap it and then you leave it alone, right? You don't go and peel it back and say, oh, is it healed yet? Is it healed yet? Um, but you wrap it and you leave it until it is fully healed. Now, Grace is on, she calls it a banded, She's on a banded and syrup. That's Neosporin. And she'll, she'll run in five times a day. Mom, I need a banded and I need a syrup because I have a boo-boo. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And so what do I do? I'm so sweet. I put the little Neosporin on it. And I put the banded on it. That's, you know, a cartoon color character. I, I, I created a monster. I really did. And I put it on. And five minutes later, Mommy, it feels so much better. Let's take it off now. It's, it's all better now. And I'm like, no, we're wasting the banded and syrup. Please stop. <laughs> and so with that, we have to remind ourselves, he is the one who wraps our wounds. And not only does he wrap us, he wants to stay there until we are fully restored. He is closer than any brother. He is our ever-present help in our time of need. He is right there. He is right there. So... 
I rewrote the Bible, just this one, don't panic. I'm not, I'm not doing a Michelle translation because once you hear it, you're going to realize I'm not buying your version because it's longer than the Amplified. Um, but I'm going to read Psalm 147 like we just broke it down. Are you ready? I said, are you all ready? Yeah. Thank you. It says, the Lord himself, he repairs the immaterial center of my being, my damaged heart that has been broken by this world. And he wraps your wounds with his own person until you are fully healed. Aren't you glad I didn't write a Bible, though? That was just one verse. Imagine what it would be this thick. That's what he does. He wraps our heart with his very person until we are fully healed. This is what he wants to do, and this is what he will do. So today, I want us to pray, and then we're going to partake in communion. Does that sound good? Because communion is another way to see freedom. I have seen freedom physically, emotionally, spiritually through communion, I think more than, than any other way. It's, it's just the Lord is restoring the communion table to the heart of the church. Hallelujah. And there's something about coming to the table to sit and to eat and to drink with the Lord. And there's fellowship with that. And, and when you partake in faith, it just, it opens up doors that are so incredible. Uh, but I want us to take a moment and I want us to pray. And then uh, we're going to receive communion. Does that sound good? Yeah. Amen. So I want you to just close your eyes for a moment. I want you to put your hand on your heart. We've been talking about our heart. And for some of us, it, there's a heaviness and there's a brokenness in our heart. And the Lord... He, he wants to see freedom from that. There's not a denying. There's not saying, God, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm praying for spiritual amnesia. No, you, you remember what happened. But when you remember it, there's not the pain that comes with it. Only the Lord can do this. I don't know how he can heal a broken heart. I can understand how he heals broken bones, broken bodies. But how he heals broken hearts... It's something that only the Lord can do. So I want you to repeat this after me. I want you to say, God, I recognize your word. I recognize that you yourself can repair my damaged heart. You yourself desire to wrap my wounds with your spirit. To cut the chain of propane in my life. To heal me. So Lord, I come to you. I give you all the damage. In my life. In my mind. In my heart. And I give myself to your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. There's such freedom. There's such freedom with him. And uh, at this time, we're going to receive communion. I'm going to have Jesse come and share what's on his heart. But like I said, the thing I love the most about communion is he, at the Last Supper, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, my body is broken for you. And, and not only was that symbolism, but that's also truth. We saw that his body was completely broken. And we have to take our eyes and our focus, and we must look at our suffering Savior. We have to. We can't ignore that. We, we can't just look at uh, our resurrected King and, and the blessed hope of his return. We must look at the suffering Savior. But when we take communion, traditionally, what do you do with your, with your piece of bread? You break it. Right? You break it in remembrance of his body being broken for you. And I want you to think for a moment when we do that, not only does that simplify or symbol as a symbol of your heart, uh, your, your body being broken, but also those moments where your heart's been broken. And, and he covers it all. He's so kind. He covers it all. So when we take this and we break it, I want us to remind ourselves um, that his body was broken. His heart, 
His heart was broken. Talk about betrayal. His heart was broken for, for us so that we don't have to deal with that propane. And the same thing with, with his blood being poured out. It washes away the pain and the sting. Amen. That's how beautiful and how kind he is. Amen. Amen.